Our program, our conversation today is this continuation of, of the U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy and, and Dr. Kellen Cachetti is here uh, from Lurie Children's. Uh, Allison Arwadi was a member, or was a part of that panel, as I mentioned, uh, Senator Simmons, who's also here today. Uh, and you can watch that on our website if you, if you weren't able to join us. Um, but Dr. Murthy shared some sobering truths about the, the state of our students, youth, and opportunity for a whole of society approach to healing. More importantly, like we appreciate here at City Club, is he shared hope and ideas for actually making things better and helping to understand ways we can reimagine our workplaces, our schools, uh, settings where we all come together, share ideas, and, and build community. So we're going to learn more today about youth guidance uh, and how this legacy organization has partnered with CPS and others to help young people through their journey of adolescence. Um, I think anyone who has gone through adolescence uh, has understood that that is a really difficult time in life. And, and we all need to be here to support the future of, of our city. So we're going to hear from a number of youth that have been through the program um, and a few that are providing all the solutions. So please help me now in welcome, welcoming Monique Harvey to the mic. Monique. Come on up, Monique. Monique has been, she's been connected to youth guidance for nearly a decade. 2014, she met her working on womanhood while counselor and mentor Ngoze Harris. Ngoze, I believe you're here today as well. I just met you. Um, please give us a wave. There we go. Good to, good to see you. So without further mention, and uh, and you'll see how the program unfolds. Uh, without further mention, thank you all to our future speakers who will be up here in a minute. Uh, and thank you, Monique, for leading us off here. Thanks, Monique. All uh, right. I think this is. Good afternoon, everyone. There you go. As my introductee mentioned, my name is Monique L. Harvey. Um, I met Ngozi Harris my junior year of high school when I was experiencing homelessness and disconnection from everybody, really. She was one of the first people who planted that first little seed that made me realize that I mattered and that I count. Um, and when I asked to do this, I thought I was gonna sing, but instead I wrote a poem specifically for this event just to give a glimpse of what we go through, especially as parents, teachers, and people who care for the community. Mom and dad say, you have nothing to worry about but they don't take the time to listen to what your troubles are about. Yes, you're getting bullied. You're not doing well in school. But my mom and dad said, they ain't raising no fool. How you get a C in this? How you get a C in that? But when you're trying to study, you're drowning out mom's smacks. Maybe if they take the time to listen to what you have to say, they'll get an understanding of what's traumatizing your life daily. Guidance counselor asks, what's really going on? But she doesn't know. The school bully is her own son. How do you tell the adult that's supposed to protect you that the adult they put in charge of you is neglecting your truth? Everyone complains and everyone knows, but he doesn't have a father, so anything goes. She smothers him with kisses, smothers him with love, but he doesn't want that. He wants his father back. She doesn't have a dad. He doesn't have a mom. So they're searching for love in each other's arms. Now they're expecting at the age of 16, unaware of the danger of living without a dream. Now a little bully has gone mad due to being unprepared. But really deep down, a little bully is just scared. Now he has to tell his mom, who's the counselor of the school, that not only is he the bully, but he's expecting to. Mom and dad said, we had nothing to worry about, but they didn't take the time to listen to what our troubles are about. Yes, we're getting bullied. We're not doing well in school, but our mom and dad said, 
They ain't raising no food. How we get a C in this? How we get a C in that? But when we're trying to study, we're drowning out mom smacks. Maybe if you take the time to listen to what we have to say, you'll get an understanding of what's traumatizing our lives daily. Moral of the story is, teens may not have bills, but they go through stuff too, as corny as it feels. If we don't lend an ear or an helping hand, they will grow mad, no matter who is there. Their tears and their cursing is just the outer layer. But really deep down, they do care. Their hearts and their brains don't truly understand that what they're feeling may not be their pain. Maybe it's their moms, maybe it's their dads, but how will you know if you didn't understand? Thank you. That's just a glimpse of what today's conversation is going to be about. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Inger Berner Ziegler. She's a licensed clinical psychologist and associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University. Her work focuses on the role of social determinants of health play and disparities in mental health and treatment. Her most recent book, Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen, examines the role trauma plays in undressing suffering. Please help me welcome Dr. Inger Burnett Zeigler. Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you, Monique, for your beautiful, powerful poem. Your vulnerability is so inspiring. And what I felt most deeply in the words that you said were the comments about listening and how it's up to us to listen to the needs of our youth. Thank you. Thank you to the City Club of Chicago Youth Guidance and everyone here for the warm welcome. It's been a pleasure to work alongside Youth Guidance, Drs. Millbrook and Crown, Ms. Harris and the team as their prevention and intervention programs are a critical resource to addressing the mental health challenges of our families and young people. Today I'd like to discuss some of those challenges our youth are facing that have a direct impact on their mental health and their ultimate ability to thrive and live out their fullest potential. Recent national surveys have shown that alarming increases in the prevalence of, mental, of certain mental health conditions. In 2019, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, one in three high school students and half of female students reported persistent feelings of sadness and hopelessness as well as suicidal thoughts and behaviors, an overall increase of 40% from 2009. Last month, Dr. Murthy shared insights from his advisory on protecting mental health of our youth, calling out the 7.7 .7 million children with treatable mental health conditions and half not receiving adequate treatment. And that was in 2016. <laughs> Since 2017, suicide has been the second leading cause of death in those 10 to 19 years old. And rates of suicide among black youth have risen faster than any other racial ethnic group for the past two decades, with suicide rates in black males aged 10 to, 16, 10 to 19 increasing by 60%. Black children 
are nearly twice as likely to die by suicide than white children. Estimates from the National Center for Self Health Statistics suggest that there were more than 6,600 deaths by suicide among those aged 10 to 24 in 2020. As we know, the COVID-19 pandemic exacerbated the challenges our youth were already facing. For many, the pandemic brought on disruption to routine, social isolation, the loss of loved ones, instability at home with parents losing their jobs, housing instability, financial insecurity, and even increases in the rates of abuse. Layer this on top of the chronic stress of a context whereby our youth are repeatedly exposed to multiple forms of trauma. While much attention appropriately has been given to the negative impact of gun violence, our youth also regularly confront other forms of trauma, including neighborhood violence, racism, physical and sexual abuse, traumatic loss, or separation. This type of trauma, community violence, racism, family conflict, are predictors of suicide among Black youth. Last academic year, nine out of 10 youth guidance working on womanhood participants reported one or more lifetime experiences with some type of traumatic event, nine out of 10. Nearly half reported one or more lifetime experiences with gender-based violence. One in four shared that they have had thoughts that they would be better off dead or of hurting themselves in some way one or more times in the previous week. Studies have shown that Black youth are at higher risk for childhood abuse, exposure to violence, and poverty, which is also a predictor for trauma. And Black adults have the highest cumulative number of traumatic events in their lifetime. It's not only the direct exposures to trauma that are harmful to our youth, but also indirect exposures or vicarious trauma that can have a negative impact like the brutal video of Tyree Nichols being beaten by police in Memphis. Our youth are too often directly or indirectly confronting these instances. You see that video and they see themselves, their fathers, their uncles, their brothers, and their cousins. They are afraid and angry. And as events like this continue to reoccur, many are hopeless. All of these factors at the individual, familial, community, and societal levels contribute to mental health problems like depression and anxiety, problems sleeping and eating, as well as poor social and academic functioning. The behaviors our youth display as a re direct result of these challenges that they've endured, such as acting out, being aggressive, challenging authority, hypersexuality, substance abuse, unfortunately are often disconnected from their trauma and mis they're misattributed and they are further punished by our systems. This is one way we fail to see and understand our youth. This is how we're not listening. Our youth are telling us they're hurting and it's up to us to pay attention. 70% of young people needing mental health prevention and intervention services can be found in our schools, and yet only 16% of those students are receiving some form of support. As a practicing psychologist, I know that most people with mental health needs do not show up in my office. They are in the community, in schools, in churches, in after-school programs at the Y. This is why the work of youth guidance is so important. They show up in the places where youth already are. During times of upheaval, we can be easily distracted by the mountain of system changes that we're fighting for. Surely systemic change is necessary to address the gaps in identification and support to which we are losing our youth. But today I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that the conversations around mental health are shifting, that mental health is increasingly a policy priority. Funders are recognizing the urgency of supporting initiatives around mental health 
and that community members and organizations are stepping up to meet the needs of our youth. The work of youth guidance is in high demand during this time of continued mental health crisis because their work is focused in community. This year, counselors from youth guidance programs are embedded in over 200 schools across the country, working to disrupt and break the cycles of intergenerational violence and trauma. In metropolitan Chicago alone, the Becoming a Man and Working on Womanhood programs are reaching over 11,000 young people across 143 schools. Dr. Nicole Milbrook, the Chief Program Officer at Youth Guidance, brings more than 20 years of clinical experience working with adults, families, and young people. Dr. Melbrook teaches in the Chicago School of Professional Psychology Forensics Program and serves on the board of the Illinois Collaboration on Youth Boulevard of Chicago and the Wingspan Project. Please help me to welcome Dr. Melbrook. Thank you, Dr. Burnett Ziegler, for those kind words and um, inspi inspiring like words for all of us. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. It's really nice to look out here and see so many people who care about youth mental health. It's also nice to see so many familiar faces. Um, Monique, thank you so much for sharing such a personal piece with us. Um, I know I heard it. I hope others did too. So today I wanna to talk a little bit about the power of connection as it relates to trauma and healing. But first, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, stigma and the role culture plays in helping us connect with each other. At last month's talk with um, Dr. Murthy, we heard that, I heard the stat that on average, it takes about 11 years of struggling with mental health before a young person obtains treatment. 11 years, not months, years before they find out like there's something wrong, I think I need help. 11 years before you actually get a service that could help. So imagine all the missed opportunities during those years, all the learning opportunities, all the times when you were not 100% present to be doing the things that people expect you to do. 11 years worth. This is a daunting reminder of the challenges before us as we continue together to rebuild our society's safety nets. There's a lot of reasons why students can't, and um, to be honest, don't access um, care. And stigma and frankly bias remain some of the overwhelming barriers. Um, internalized and societal stigma remains significant barrier for most, if not all communities of color with more than half Hispanic young adults ages 18 to 25 with serious mental health, um, mental illness going without treatment, lack of cultural responsiveness, legal status, discrimination, those things only add to the pervasive cycle of stigma, keeping families fearful of taking anyone outside the home and, um, and uh, telling people about what might be happening. So that's just one example of barriers that are in place um, for youth of color. I wanna also add that um, when many people look at youth of color who are struggling and acting out, they see somebody who's in need of discipline, not someone who's in need of care, which is another barrier. By bringing counselors into the lives of students in small doses every day, youth guidance programs are addressing the unmet needs of children who otherwise wouldn't have access to mental health assessments, culturally responsive counselors, and cognitive behavioral group therapy. Students in these services don't believe they're going to a service to get help with the problem. They're engaged because they feel connected to their peer community. They have a sense of belonging, they're receiving support while they're on this journey of becoming themselves. 
in Youth Guidance's Becoming a Man program and working on womanhood programs, students are learning to understand themselves differently. They're all learning self-awareness, the ability to understand their emotional reactions and the language around their life experiences. And they're doing so alongside other youth who are having similar experiences, along with a counselor who comes from where they come from and also understands those experiences. During their sessions, students build a sense of community, and the science tells us that meaningful connections create healing for all of us who've experienced any form of trauma. Notice I said us, not them, right? Trauma is widespread. All of us who've experienced trauma um, heal when having meaningful connections with other human beings. By building these opportunities to connect and discuss how you're feeling and relating into the fabric of the school schedule or the day-to-day -day schedule of a person, these moments feel more natural and they can have lasting effects. That's why it doesn't feel like going to a service. It's just a part of the school day. These natural connections facilitated by the leadership of a counselor are the kinds of bonds that can stay with the student for a lifetime. By bringing students together in group sessions of 10 to 12, led by a counselor who, just by being there, lessens the stigma of what it means to talk about responses to pain, feelings of loss, and how to navigate the very complex realities the students are dealing with. Youth guidance is helping to create stability, reconnection in communities that have suffered greatly, and in the wake of violence and intergenerational pain. And I saw that Senator Simmons is here from, hi, good to see you, um, from last month's talk. Thank you so much for speaking to this issue last month, um, reflecting that so many of our young people don't wanna burden their parents and caregivers with their troubles because they already see how overwhelmed parents and caregivers are. We hear this a lot from our students too. They feel that they're carrying the weight of the world and this is exactly when having a caring, nurturing adult, like a counselor, stepping in can be really, really useful to create that connection. Creating these safe spaces where students learn they're not alone, they're not the sum of their trauma, this is how healing becomes a part of their day-to-day -day experiences. Parent engagement programs, like um, Parent Ambassadors, Youth Guidance's Parent Leadership Conference, that's coming up next month, by the way. Um, they're creating similar opportunities for parents and guardians. When parents and school personnel are encouraged to engage with one another, more opportunities for meaningful connections with the child are created. Creating opportunities for parents to have meaningful connections with one another leads to healthier adults, strengthens the natural environment for young people. Young people just need to have more of those um, genuine human connections, those moments where they can connect with another person in a really genuine way. And when adults have got the um, support they need, they can provide a healthier environment and more likely to be present for their kids when they come home. By meeting students and families where they are, counselors have the chance to engage parents, caregivers, offering nurturing supports and paths to healing. This work takes incredible partnership with school leaders, principals, teachers, and school-based teams. Without the support of on-the-ground school leaders and community partners, um, much of what we do would not be possible. Um, and yet, there is just so much more to do. This year, Youth Guidance has received outreach from over 25 school communities asking for programs, counselor support, professional development consultation, and trauma-informed training. The impacts of destigmatizing mental health programs are driving continued learning, evaluation, and innovation. Over the last two decades, Youth Guidance has partnered with incredible research talent, serving to inform and broaden the ways we collectively understand the impacts of programs designed by and for communities of color. During 2009 through 2010, and again in 2013 to 2015, the University of Chicago Crime Lab evaluated the Becoming a Man program in two separate randomized control trials. The research team found participation in BAM during the first study reduced violent crime arrests for youth in the program by 45%. 
The program also had lasting impacts on school engagement. BAM increased on-time high school graduation rates by 19%. In the 2013 to 2015 study, BAM reduced violent crime arrests by 50% and again has significant impacts on school engagement. During the 2016 school year, WOW partnered with Lurie's Children's Hospital on a community-based participatory research project and published Working on Womanhood, a participatory formative evaluation of a community-developed intervention in the peer-reviewed journal Evaluation and Program Planning. The findings provided preliminary evidence of the acceptability of the WOW program. Most recently, the University of Chicago Education Lab found that the Working on Womanhood program can significantly reduce post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety and depression among Black and Latina young women, reducing PTSD symptoms by a staggering 22% among adolescent girls in Chicago neighborhood schools. On behalf of our partnership with the Ed Labs, we're looking forward to more news coming soon. Thank you for your incredible partnership. Currently, Youth Guidance continues to build on this growing body of research by adding more qualitative data, information, and context to the stories that shape the lives of our counseling workforce. This work, in partnership with Northwestern's Feinberg School of Medicine, hopes to help advance the diversified workforce, serving to protect our frontline counselors from burnout and compassion fatigue. The humanity and the simplicity of seeing each other and being seen is more powerful to our healing than we realize. The, um, we, as humans, we're hardwired to connect with each other, especially in times of crisis. And um, quite honestly, the pandemic has made that much harder to do naturally. It's caused us to have to be more intentional in our connections with um, other human beings. We've already discussed a little bit about how meaningful human connection can be to facilitating heal, healing and resilience. I just wanna stress one more thing, and that is that having at least one space where you can be authentically yourself is just so important. Um, and I kinda wanna illustrate that with you all for a second. I would like to ask everybody to just think about one time when you were with at least one other person and you felt as if you didn't have to wear a mask or meet anybody else's expectations, where you could just be, just be you. Maybe it was a family gathering, maybe you were with a friend or two. Um, maybe it was a moment where the mask just simply got too heavy and you couldn't hold it up anymore. Now think about what it felt like to be in that moment and think about how you felt after being in those um, moments of connection and authenticity. That's what real healing feels like. We all have masks that represent the different versions of ourselves that are appropriate for the different situations. Um, one of these versions is the most authentic part of who we are. And that's the one that authentic connections allow space for. In the next segment, you're gonna hear from Youth Guidance alumni about what those connections look and felt like for them while they were in our programs. So now I wanna invite our alumni up. So I ask that you all help me welcome Anthony, Devante, Bianca, and Monique. Hey, oh. Look at you, remember my place. Oh, hold on, Jesus. Oh. Okay, here we go. All right, thank you all for being here today. So why don't we start with, um, why don't we start with you, Anthony? Um, can you share a little bit about yourself and what you're up to now? 
little bit about myself. Um, so, that's a broad question. <laughs> Just to pick one thing, um, I've been with Youth Guidance, what, since 2014, uh, been a participant, then going on to be a volunteer. Um, I work at Northwestern University uh, in the subcontract department. Uh, I guess that's pretty much it. I mean, it's so much <laughs> about me, but to keep it short. All right, that's great, thank you. Um, Devante, you have um, a lot of perspective. How long have you been connected with Youth Guidance and what are you up to these days? As far as um, how long I've been connected, if you want to say in high school, four years, but we're talking about continuation at the high school. So I graduated in 2015. So from 15 to now, like eight years. So what I'm up to now, well, I'm still in youth guidance. I'm with the uh, Illumina. Ah! Uh, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm with the uh, Illumina. Ah! I'm with the alumni. I'm with the alumni um, YG, which is Miss um, Cruz. She's the uh, she control of that. Um, I'm go I go to a uh, Rasmussen. I'm in college for racial nursing. I'm a part of the Illinois Juvenile Justice Commission, and I'll, I'm on the Youth Advisory Board, the YB. Um, so that's just a little bit about me. All right, Youth Guidance Alum doing big things. Um, and Bianca, thank you for being here. I know you had to work around your schedule and we're glad to have you. Um, can you share a little bit about how long you've been connected to Youth Guidance and what you've been doing lately? So I've been uh, with Youth Guidance for about four years and so on. Um, I am currently in college. Um, I'm soon to receive my associates. Um, I'm also part-time. I'm currently working on uh, at a store right now. And that's about me right now. Hey, great, thank you. And Monique, we heard a little bit about your background earlier, and I'm wondering if you could, um, if you could talk a little bit about, if you could reflect a little bit about a particular day that you feel comfortable sharing about. Um, any, like a specific, we wanna think about a specific moment that you really needed a counselor when you were at school and Ngozi was there and wh why it was so important to have her there. Ooh, I had a lot of those days. So I gotta pick one? Okay. Um, well, one day in particular, um, I'll go with the um, I came home from school and I was living with my grandmother at the time. And, you know, you get home from school, you're ready to eat, take your clothes off, go outside. And I couldn't take a shower because there was no running water. And I tried to turn the heat on and that wouldn't come on either. So I was like, okay, I'm stuck. <laughs> so I called and I was like, I don't know what to do. And she's like, is there someone's house you can go to? And so. Um, I didn't know at the time that I was having a panic attack. I didn't even know what that was. Like, I don't have panic attacks. Um, so that that was the first day that I was like, okay, I'm going to need some help because I didn't know what to do, how to do it. You know, I'm 15, 16, you know. So that day, definitely, she, uh, she was like, you know, she gave me that initial seed to ask for help because, you know, mm -hmm. used to doing everything on your own. Like, I don't know what help is, so. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. So I want to give um, the rest of you an opportunity to share a similar moment, a time where it was just important to have somebody you knew and somebody you knew you could be authentic with right there in the space with you. Um, I'll take that. Um, so uh, my BAM counselor, Mr. Frazier, Cameron Frazier, um, I had, you know, teenage stuff. So so, <laughs> so I had a issue with taking accountability. Um, I always had excuses, and also when it came to academics, I didn't feel like I was good enough. Um, so I had Mr. Frazier sit down with me, and he told me stuff about myself that I didn't know. That hey, I matter. I can do that. I'm 
capable, I'm more capable than anybody. Um, when it came to accountability, I always had excuses. Like, I didn't go to class because like, I slipped on some ice, <laughs> which actually happened. So, <laughs> but um, just holding me accountable and saying like, hey, you are responsible for graduating. And if you don't, that's on you. You can't blame nobody but yourself. Excuses are only good for the person that's giving them out. And that was really important. Even going into my career at Northwestern, I'm like, hey, I'm responsible for contract funding. And if it, something happens, that's on me. Accountability is a skill, core value that will go on in life that, that not just you will use in your four years of high school, but forever. Um, the question was, uh, was uh, what again? Um, you have an opportunity to share about a moment um, or why it was important that you had your counselor available when they were available. And it could be any of the eight years every day that you've been involved with youth guidance. Um, so I can't think of a particular situation, but as far as why I felt like they was important because being a, well, I feel like we can all relate to this. Um, somebody standing on their word and saying what they're gonna do and doing it. And that's one of the affirmations of BAM, which is, integrity, accountability, things of that nature. So, you know, being a kid or being, you know, adolescent or whatever you want to, you know, tight up and throw on it. Um, you know, looking at the world and, you know, having mistrust and, you know, things of that nature, you know, and you knowing somebody that, that you come to them, they stand on their word or, you know, they just carry themselves a particular way. Now, even as an adult, you know, you know, it's still important because, you know, you got responsibilities and it's like, I, you know, you dealing with people networking and, you know, people say things, it's like, okay, you don't know to take it for their word or just, you know, laugh out high, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, being younger, I felt like it's, like I said, you're younger, your mind is not fully developed. And then, you know, you're seeing your surroundings, you're seeing things all around the world. So you kind of get like, uh, you know, iffy. But when you know it's somebody that's true to themselves and they say this and that, or even if, you know, sometimes, you know, things that work out, they'll let you know, like, you know, we'll walk the band. They'll tell you <laughs> certain things and be like, it didn't work out. And they let you know. So it ain't, even if you disappoint, it's the fact that you let me know. It's like, all right, I can navigate or try to figure something else out. Thank you. And don't apologize for authenticity. <laughs> you can be you right here. <laughs> and just like that. Bianca, you have anything you want to add? Uh, yeah. So uh, a moment that I'm actually like thankful for having my counselor. Um, when I was in my second year of um, high school, one of my family members passed away. And um, I didn't know how to process the emotions. And um, thankfully, I had Miss Cruz helping me um, guide my feelings. Um, I wouldn't pretty much talk to my family because I didn't know how to open to my family. Um, we were all going through the same thing, so we were. Um, it was difficult for us to talk about it. But thankfully, um, she helped me how to process my emotions. Um, she told me it was okay to cry. She told me it was okay to feel this way. And till this day, um, what she told me, um, it has stuck in with me out of all the time is because it's, it's not hard to process like, you know, some a family member um, gone. Um, and I'm thankful for having her in that moment. Mm. Oh, thank you for sharing. Um, do we have time for one more question for the alums? No, okay. <laughs> all right. Um, well, as we wrap this portion, I, I am reminded of um, one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Murthy's talk last month, he shared something that um, he learned from his own mentor and it really stuck with me. Um, he said, when you stand in your strength, you allow others to find you. So I wanna thank Monique, Anthony, Bianca and Devante, um, and also Christian, Mina and Jarvis who are also alums who are out there for coming today. Thank you all for showing up and responding when we reached out and thank you for standing in your strength so others can see you.
Now, I have the distinct honor of introducing you all to Youth Guidance's CEO, Michelle Adler Morrison. Um, Michelle began her journey with Youth Guidance over 25 years ago and is a licensed clinical social worker, having recently won the National Association of Social Worker, Social Worker of the Year Award in 2018. Please welcome Michelle. Wow, I'm getting qu I'm getting questions. So the I think this hadn't even started, and I was already getting questions. So I love how engaged this group is. Um, just thank you so much for being here today. I'm incredibly grateful and humbled by the expertise of our alum, the expertise of our team, and to you, um, Dr. Inger Burnett Ziegler for walking this journey with us professionally. And uh, this work is personal and we feel it and we right. deeply appreciate the way you pour your expertise um, and create collaborations uh, that strengthen all of us. So. Just thank you so much. And again, thank you to the, the students who are here and our alumni. Uh, you're the reason we exist. Um, and we are inspired every day uh, to walk alongside you. Um, it is really my greatest privilege in life to serve at Youth Guidance and walk alongside the journey of so many incredible, talented, passionate, and dedicated counselors and young people. I also want to acknowledge the leadership of our board who turned out big time in this room. I want to recognize Paul Riley, our board president. Where are you, Paul, if you could wave? And our other board members who are here. You lead by example and you lead with your heart. Um, youth guidance keeps youth at the center of our mission. And it's youth who've helped us develop programs that meet their needs. And I'm not sure, or I'm pretty sure most of you know teenagers, young people, they vote with their feet. If it's not relevant, they're not coming. Young people, I'm glad to say, really show up to BAM and WOW. And they refer their friends and they refer their siblings. Our counselors really do build safe healing spaces, but the young people, they do the heavy lifting. They take on the difficult task of learning how to express complex emotions with words, to ask for help, to be vulnerable, to share their story, to be challenged, to help others, and to strive to live in alignment with their values both in and out of school. And we're committed to doing right by them, by doing what works and to improve their outcomes. And this means continuous, rigorous evaluation of what we do. It's through partnership that we've been able to establish a robust evidence base, as well as the internal capacity for continuous quality improvement. This is incredibly important in our sector. We've learned so much that's helped strengthen our programs and practices through partnerships with Chapin Hall, the University of Chicago Urban Labs, Lurie Center for Resilience, Childhood Resilience, the School Health Access Collaborative, Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine, and communities, communities of practice, such as the Illinois Children's Mental Health Partnership, Strengthening Chicago's Youth, and the MBK Alliance. These partnerships are all in service of supporting the unmet needs of our students and have brought about increased access to evidence-based services, important knowledge for the entire sector, and transformative change. Thank you for standing alongside our mission and to all the partners in this room, including school staff, community-based organizations, universities, elected officials, philanthropic and corporate partners who have stepped up to join us in the fight for equitable access to high quality mental health supports and for social justice. I'm in, all of, I'm in awe of all of you and your commitment is making a difference. Thank you to each one of you. The truth is none of us walk this journey alone. Something we often don't get a chance to talk about are how the families we serve remain the foundation of our work. A special thank you to our parent ambassadors who are joining us here today. Thank you, Yvette and Dorothy and Della for representing our parent community. If you're a caregiver or even have close relationships with a young person in your own life, 
You know how challenging it is to watch a child struggle and suffering. Not knowing how to help, not understanding what they're going through, or not having the right resource to do something carries tremendous pain. The caregivers of our students carry those burdens too. And so often they want to help and they just don't know what to do or they lack the access to the kind of mental health supports their children need for so many reasons. Stigma, long wait lists, cost, lack of a provider who looks like them or who can connect with them, who can forge trust. But in schools, these barriers are removed. In schools, our full-time staff become critical lifelines and can identify problems early and in many cases prevent small problems from becoming big problems later down the line that may, that may require much higher levels of intervention and disruption to the person's life. As Dr. Murthy stated and Nicole talked about, and I heard like a, a gasp in this room, it takes 11 years on average from when a child is first experiencing symptoms to when they actually get help. And do you know an estimated 14 million American students attend schools with no nurses, counselor, or mental health staff? 14 million young people? Our young people and families can't afford to wait 11 years. By having youth guidance staff in schools, we offer help right away. And often the young people stay engaged in school while accessing that help. In schools, we create safe spaces, healing spaces, where students can feel that they belong, where they can be heard, where they can unplug from the toxins of social media and be accepted for who they are. Sometimes we forget that the next generation really can take things further than we did if we give them the tools to do so. Imagine, just imagine yourself learning at a young age how to name what you were feeling. And imagine being able to do that among other teenagers in high school. It's almost unimaginable for me. There's no way I could have done it. And then you learn that you weren't alone in your own feelings and your experiences and that others felt the same way and that others were willing to listen and help. It's that muscle we're helping young people develop for when they really are gonna need to call on that muscle. And I'm reminded of Monique's poem if you took the time to listen to, say, to what I have to say, you'll get an understanding of what's traumatizing my life daily. Wow, we are listening. And we are meeting youth where they are and we are creating safe spaces for our young people to grow and develop and thrive. These are the antidotes to the loneliness, anxiety, and depression our students are confronting. We are removing stigma and we are redefining strength to include authenticity and vulnerability. And we're acknowledging that your trauma doesn't define you, that you own your narrative. We are modeling that even people at the top of their game, as Dr. Murthy talked about last time, that the people at the top of their game benefit from coaches and guides and mentors. Learning does happen through relationships. And that is why our secret sauce remains the ability of our staff to establish authentic relationships and then facilitate healthy relationships among students themselves across differences and deepening their connection to school. Especially, essentially, they're practicing the social and emotional skills that will serve them in school and in their family and in their community and throughout their life, throughout life's ups and downs. I think that's why you see in these in-school programs this impact on community because young people are carrying what they learn in school into how they're engaging in the choices they're making and the people they surround themselves with. The reality is there are very few people in this world not touched by grief, by trauma, by stress from the sometimes heartbreaking things beyond our control. For many of us, our way of dealing with this is to push through, to numb, to distract from the pain rather than address it. In short doses, that may work for a short time. But as Dr. Burnett Ziegler points out in her book, unaddressed trauma or pushing through chronic stress does come at a cost. Depression, anxiety, eating disorders, suicide, violence. During the shutdown, adults and young people pushed through just to get through. Those with access to strong support systems still suffered but fared better. Those disconnected from their support systems or those unable to recognize or address their distress have not fared well 
and mental health providers and systems are still overwhelmed beyond their capacity. When it comes to the pandemic, somebody has said this and it really stuck with me. When it comes to the pandemic, we were in the same storm, but not the same boat. Some of us had yachts, some had canoes, and some were drowning. Wow, what does that say about our mental health uh, structure you know, and access to, to mental health supports? We're now in a period that calls for all of us to make bold actions to improve equitable access to mental health supports and prevention services. And when I think about the enormous opportunity before us across the city of Chicago, across our counties, across the state of Illinois to protect mental health, the mental health of our young people, I think about the responsibility we have to advance universal mental health screenings, to early identification of challenges so that young people don't have to wait 11 years, to continue to innovate and bring healing-centered programs to schools who are working hard to transform the culture and climate in their school communities, to incentivize a diverse, expert mental health workforce and to help our schools become safe havens for our students and families like community schools that create robust access within a community to support that family's needs. Families who are seeking stability and reassurance, connection and healing. Schools really are the hubs of our neighborhoods and they remain places where we can continue to impact so many lives. Lives of students who right now may be feeling alone. One of our, our most critical reflective experiences for young people is the act of envisioning themselves in the future. Thank you for being a part of that vision and for your commitment to listening to our young people and to each other. I would love if we still have time to have Dr. Burnett Ziegler come on back up and really open it up for questions. Um, we do have two and I'd love uh, Nicole and, and to jump into. Um, the first question is, can you speak to the vicarious trauma and how employers of colleges or schools can be more responsive um, and accommodating to the mental health needs in the wake of things like the body cam footage from Memphis, just as a recent example? Thank you for that important question. I think it couldn't be uh, more timely, this issue of vicarious trauma. And I think um, an important place to start is really recognizing what vicarious trauma is and how that shows up in individuals' day-to-day -day lives. It can be footage of things that are violent that are seen on television. It can be conversations. It could be the work that is being done. For example, um, our youth guidance counselors are potentially susceptible to vicarious trauma through the work that they're doing to support young people. And so as employers, we must recognize those vulnerabilities to vicarious trauma that layer on top of the traumatic experiences that people are already experiencing in their day-to-day -day life. They may be bringing with them a history of abuse, a history of intimate partner violence, and then recognizing the, the signs and symptoms, how that shows up in mood, how that shows up in productivity, and being a uh, part of connecting them to treatment, either as a uh, as a part of the employer, if you're able to offer treatment or connect them to treatment in the community. Thank you for that question. Thank you. We got, we got a couple more. And that one of, I, I think you might want to take this one, Nicole. This is, um, how can telebehavioral health and online behavioral health tools help address the child's behavioral health crisis? Hmm. Really good question. Um, I think telehealth tools and online behavioral health services um, are one of the things that increased during the pandemic, increased access during the pandemic. And um, basically, it's allowed more people access to behavioral health services. One, um, access in that we think about access as far as, oh, everybody's got a computer. Not everybody's got a computer or a device. So not that kind of access, but access as in I don't know that everybody realizes how um, many steps it takes to go from calling the number to actually sitting in the office. And all the steps along the way are an opportunity for the person to back out and say, I'm not gonna do this. Um, behavioral health has decreased the number of steps and the amount of time. So it's harder to back out. The sooner you can get somebody like in front of a counselor from the moment they make the decision, the more likely they are to follow through, make the connection, and heal. So I think that's that's one of the things 
that um, telehealth has, has done for us. Um, another question had to do with um, reaching, uh, creating prevention and promotion strategies for younger youth. Um, and I, I can say from the youth guidance perspective, although our Becoming a Man and Working on Womanhood programs are uh, seventh through 12th, it's really that kind of open period of adolescence when young people act like they're not open, but they really are. In terms of brain development, that's what BAM and WOW are based on because it, it's really effective with uh, cognitive behavioral interventions. Um, but a lot of our work is with whole schools. So that can be as early as pre-K through 12th grade. Um, and as I was talking about the work of the community schools approach of really rallying the social, emotional, mental health supports to bring them in house helps schools. Again, this is all in service of uh, schools um, really helping the adults in the school create a culture and a climate that's really healthy uh, for development is another way. And then supporting work uh, like Lurie's for, you know, how do you help behavioral health teams be effective so that they're really able to intervene at the appropriate level for all ages of development? So thank you for that question. Um, you're, thank you. you're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. Thank, thanks to all of you. Dr. Melbrook, uh, I heard you earlier, um, I heard all of you, but this is not definitely an us, not them, right? This is all of us, uh, and I believe all of us in this room, you know, everyone is affected in, in, in some manner, uh, has experienced trauma, affected by behavioral health, and, and we in this room are, are all can be part of the solution, um, and that's kind of what City Club is all about. So lots more to come. And thank you for bringing this to all of our attention. Thank you to the Crown School, University of Chicago, Dean Deborah Gorman-Smith and Adrian Talbot, of course. Thank you, Youth Guidance, Michelle, Dr. Milbrook. Of course, thank you to all of our alumni and, and your mentors and those that, uh, and, and guidance counselors who, by the way, I believe we have a birthday. Is that, do you want to mention that? And Gozi's birthday is today, so. The, these are all the folks that are that are helping shape the future leaders of our city and the future members of City Club and the and and all the great things that'll come from for the next few years in, in Chicago. Um, so thank you for to all of you. I do have two quick orders of business. Amanda, uh, we'll ask uh, we'll ask Mark and Rose from from the um, Kennedy Forum to pull a card out of the fishbowl. Um, thank you, Mark, for all the great work that you and your organization do. It's always good to have you here. And you can't pick your own name. <laughs> Thanks, Amanda, for... All right, so we've got... Now, this is a Chicago Cut gift card for $200, uh, just a couple blocks away. Linda Foreman from Certified Public Accountants. Linda Foreman, are you here? Great, congratulations. Enjoy some lunch or dinner and drinks. If you see Amanda, she'll make sure you get the card. And then I will present a, uh, a one-year membership to each of our speakers and, and hope that you all come back often. We have so much more to discuss, uh, but not today anymore. We've, we've, we've covered some good stuff. Thank you all. City Club is adjourned. Have a great day. See you all back here soon. Thanks. Thanks.